If it happens to be that you feel all mixed up at this point in the course, well, there's good news because right now in this video, I'm going to cover the theory, the linear algebra of mixing things up. That is, we're going to talk about permutations. Now, I mentioned this when we started linear algebra. I'll keep saying it, that uh, for some of you, this will be totally, just completely review. Um, some of you will have seen it um, before and need to kind of remember it. Some will have completely forgot it. Um, that's all fine, but it's fundamental. So if you're ever wondering, like, when would be a good time to really learn uh, some of these aspects of linear algebra, now's the time. So today uh, we're going to do permutations. So it, if you want to think of a permutation as just some way of rearranging a list, that's totally fine. It's a good starting point. So here I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, and I've rearranged it to 3, 1, 0, 2. So I've rearranged every every thing in the first list gets a position, a new place, a new home in the second list. So you can think of this permutation as a kind of function. Right? In this case, it's a function from 4 to 4, right? This is the numbers from 0 up to 3, inclusive. And it's a bijection. And that's really important. You can always, when you permute stuff, you can unpermute it. Um, so you can, there's an inverse as well. All right, so in terms of linear algebra, you might have think, you might think of these as vectors. In fact, maybe it's better to think of them as column vectors. There's really a nice clean way to write this permutation as a matrix. So there's some matrix P where P times this vector will give us the permuted vector. You notice actually it's the same permutation we had before. The first item ends up in the third spot and the second item stays the same and etc. So they move around. And if you were to just try to figure out what this matrix P was, just by using maybe basic knowledge of what this matrix vector multiplication should be as say solving some system of linear equations, if we put in some unknowns here, because we don't know what they're supposed to be, there's some x0, x1, x2, x3. I'm using x's, but don't think of these as the variables, right? These are the coefficients in some linear equation. There would be 16 of them, because this is going to be a 4 by 4 matrix. Uh, but we know that, let's see, at least the first equation for, with these unknowns, we know that it should give us uh, d. Right? So if I, I can write the rest of it here. But all that, all that matters here is that x0 times a plus x1 times b plus x2 times c plus x3 times d is just equal to d. And so hopefully it's not too hard to see that a good solution here, because we don't know what a, b, c, d are, but a good solution that always works is to say x0 is equal to x1 is equal to x2, and these are all 0. And then x3 is equal to 1. Right, so in a way, this row is just picking out the, a particular item in this vector. In particular, in this case, it's the last one. And if you follow the same logic, what you'll get is a matrix that, where there's our first row, the one we just computed. And for the next one, it's going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, where we picked out now the B for this one. The next one, we're going to want to grab the A, so that's going to be 1, 0, 0, 0. And the last one is 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay, so if you looked at it really fast, it sort of looks almost like, almost like an identity matrix. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the rows have been rearranged. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, this is just the same permutation that we wanted it to do to this matrix. We just permuted the rows, right? So in a way, this permutation matrix P, it's a permutation of the rows of the identity. Just call it I. Okay, so that's one way to get it. Uh, we can also write out explicitly what it is. Um, perhaps the, the best way to get there is to first think like, what does the matrix do to standard basis vectors? This is really almost always the best way 
to get a good feel for a matrix, other than maybe drawing pictures if, you, if it's low dimensional. Um, so we know that I'm going to take this matrix P and I'm going to, if I apply it to a standard basis vector BI, what I would expect to happen is that, well, the corresponding basis vector B sigma of I, sigma is the name I've given here to the permutation that P is supposed to do, right? Because this is all just taking, there's only one non-zero element in here at index I, and that element is going to get placed in position sigma of I. All the other zeros can get rearranged however they want. In fact, I just don't care. They're all going to stay zero. So all we did was to move that unique one element to a new index. Right, the, because it's a standard basis vector, there's only one, uh, one to a new index. Okay, and I just put it here as a reminder of myself, really, to tell you, like, why do we care about this now at this point in the course? Is that we've been talking about the linear algebra of graphs. So we extracted vector spaces, and then we had linear transformations, and then we had matrices that came from graphs, in particular, the Laplacian was our most important one, but it contained within it also this adjacency matrix. And when we wrote these matrices down, it actually mattered what order we placed the vertices. In fact, we wrote them in the Laplacian in terms of the incidence matrix. And in that case, we had to choose both an ordering for the vertices and an ordering for the edges. And so if we're thinking about these orderings, in terms of linear algebra, well, they are just permutations. So we want to see to what extent applying a permutation is going to affect or change these objects that we computed and what, what they will mean for us uh, for the invariants that we extract from these. So the goal is invariance to vertex edge ordering. We would like to say that it doesn't matter at all, and, but we'll, the way we'll get there is to see exactly to what extent it does matter, when it matters and when it doesn't. All right. So important to point out here that these permutations are isomorphisms. If I wanted to write out that matrix entirely for a given permutation, I would just write it in terms of its elements here. So it has an element one if sigma i is equal to j, and zero otherwise. Now, uh, you can just double check, you'll see that if we had the permutation that maps everything to itself, this would in fact give us the identity matrix like you might expect. And the permutation sigma has an inverse, right? So there exists some sigma inverse, which is also a permutation. And so you could write the matrix for the inverse as well. Again, it's a one if sigma inverse of i is equal to j and zero otherwise. This definition, of course, this would be equivalent if I applied sigma to both sides. Sigma is a bijection, so I can apply sigma to both sides. And I get uh, that this would be one if sigma of sigma inverse of i is just writing i. So that's just if i is equal to sigma of j and zero otherwise, but looking up at our definition right here, we say that this is just the definition of P, J, I. And so what we've actually just derived here is that uh, P inverse is equal to P transpose, right? I just swapped the indices. All right, so I got this kind of nice fact that to invert a permutation in terms of its matrix, you just transpose the matrix. Uh, it's probably one of the easiest matrices that you could have to ever invert. Like usually, you know, like finding inverses, you have to hope first of all that it exists and then you usually have to do some uh, row operations, etc. But here it's dead simple. We're just transpose it to get the inverse. All right. So again, I mentioned this, we're going to look at the incident, I'm sorry, the boundary matrix. And that boundary matrix, it's n by m, 
we can think of it as taking um, sets of edges or functions on the edges and giving us back functions on the vertices. And uh, it was defined, of course, in terms of this ordering. So we pick every column here, corresponds to some edge ej, and every row here is going to be some vertex vi. And we had this ordering or this orientation of the graph that is we oriented each edge so that uh, one of the terms will be one and one will be negative one. If I now ask like what happens if I were to reorder the vertices, that is I were to apply some permutation, I put the p sub n here to mean a permutation of n by n, and I multiply it by this matrix that will give me a, a new matrix where I've permuted the rows of the, this boundary matrix. So, or I could multiply by um, M by M matrix on the right side, and that will be like reordering or rearranging the edges. Okay, so uh, vertices here again is, uh, oops, that's rows, and this is columns. If we do this, we can look at what happens to the corresponding vector spaces. So the definition of the cycle space of the graph was the kernel of this matrix. So it is all the vectors in our M that map to zero. The two permutations that I've defined here could be thought of also as linear transformations. We won't make too much of a distinction between a matrix and the linear transformation that it represents. And so I have these as well. And as we just saw, these are isomorphisms. So the first simplest thing to check is that if I took this composition Pn times boundary times x, if this is equal to 0, that implies that uh, if I take the inverse of both sides here, the inverse of Pn is uh, Pn transpose. Pn transpose times 0 is still 0. So that implies that this is still in the kernel. So I had uh, uh, x was in the kernel of this. It means that x is also just in the kernel here. So that immediately implies that I have this isomorphism. In fact, it's equality. It's actually the same set. If I take the kernel of this transformation right here. So that means if I reorder the vertices, um, I get um, the same cycle space. And similarly now, using the fact that this is an isomorphism, uh, this subspace of he this, the cycle space lives as a subspace in here. If I took the inverse of PM, uh, that subspace gets mapped isomorphically to a su a, another subspace here, but it's an isomorphism, so it's actually going to be the same. So this is also isomorphic to taking the kernel of Pn boundary Pm. So this is uh, rearranging the, the vertices, rearranging the edges. I get a, perhaps in some sense, it looks like a different subspace, but it's isomorphic. Uh, so I get this in, in, in terms of linear algebra, right, the equivalence, the equivalence relation on vector spaces is isomorphism. So this vector space we got from the graph really did not depend on the ordering of the vertices and, and edges. And we could do the same thing for the cut space. So the cut space, if you recall, was the image of the transpose of that boundary map. And uh, that, it will then similarly be isomorphic to the image of just taking this composition of that map with these isomorphisms. I could put transposes here as well if you like. If, um, but uh, so the cut space, the cycle space, both of these spaces are up to isomorphism 
independent of how we ordered the vertices and edges. Let's check what happens to the Laplacian. So remember, we took this boundary map and we constructed a Laplacian. So it was equal to this times its transpose. That was our definition. If we instead had a different boundary map that we got from reordering the vertices and reordering the edges, but still the same graph, uh, then we would get the following. We'd get, let's call it L prime sub G. This is going to look a little bit longer because we're going to write it all out now. We would take this new boundary and multiply it by its transpose. Okay, now the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes, but you reverse the order. So you get something like this, PN boundary, PM, PM transpose, boundary, PN transpose. Now, what's good about this, of course, is that the middle terms here, this is PM times PM transpose, permutations, their inverse is their transpose. These just cancel out. So that gives me PN times what is left, uh, boundary times, oh, I missed the transpose, boundary transpose in there, which is just LG times PN transpose. So the new Laplacian that I got. It's a different matrix, but it has uh, the old one in there, right? So all I've done is I've reordered the rows and columns. I've applied the same permutation to the rows and the columns. And, uh, and so that just gives me, again, the same Laplacian matrix up to this, this permutation of the vertex ordering. And I think that probably would, uh, would be kind of maybe, I don't want to say obvious, but pretty immediate from this definition we expanded out, if you'll recall, which was that the diagonal was going to be the degrees. Um, oops, if what i equals j, and it was going to be negative 1 if uh, vi was a neighbor of vj, I'll just write it like this, and zero otherwise. So given this definition, it seems like, well, if I just reordered or renamed the vertices, I should get, again, the same structure, except the indices will get changed. In fact, if I have this permutation pn is written as the permutation for a particular, um, I'm sorry, the permutation matrix for a particular permutation sigma, I could just kind of replace all the i's and j's with sigma of i, sigma j. So that was just uh, a bit of a whirlwind look at what happens to uh, cycle space, cut space, Laplacians if we had changed or chosen a different ordering on our vertices and edges when we write this, um, this boundary map. Okay, that boundary linear transformation, which is really fundamental, is our basic way of going from uh, edge space to vertex space, and it's transpose going the other way. Uh, and so if we chose different orderings, we are going to get different matrices out, um, but they're different in a kind of predictable way. And we'll see in the next video when we look at invariance from these matrices, how, um, how we can kind of overcome those differences so that we get good invariance. So stay tuned for that.